Yeah. Make a start. Morning, everybody. Uh, congratulations, you won first prize at uh, the 8 a.m. Uh, uh, event. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us here this morning to <coughs> discuss uh, the effect of technology on uh, public services and anything else that seems interesting to us as we get through <laughs> Uh, the conversation. We'll keep it fairly free-flowing. My name is uh, Alex Thomas. I'm a programme director at the uh, Institute for uh, Government and I lead our work on the civil service and uh, policy making. Um, uh, so uh, really pleased to uh, introduce a fantastic uh, panel. This is an on-the-record uh, event. It's being uh, streamed uh, and there will be, uh, 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 there will be uh, the ability to watch it back again on our uh, website uh, and elsewhere over the course of the coming couple of uh, days. Um, uh, so, uh, brilliant panel to talk about um, the sorts of questions uh, uh, around um, COVID, how COVID has transformed public services uh, for good and ill, um, talk about how that's changed the relationship between the citizen and the state, where it, how it should change, how it, um, some of the risks, some of the opportunities, and some of the people who've been left behind or risk being left behind by uh, technological change. So we can cover all, all, all of those and more in the next, uh, in the next hour or so. Um, but to introduce the panel, I'll start, uh, go left to right, um, uh, we have uh, Professor Martin Marshall, who is Chair of the Royal College of GPs, um, he's a practising GP, um, he also leads uh, Improvement Science London, uh, and uh, has been Director of R&D at the Health Foundation and a Senior Civil Servant. Simon Cullersy Aldridge is Director of External Affairs at Public, which is um, public sector um, uh, consultancy uh, that solves uh, uh, problems, uh, uh, sorry, consultancy that solves problems in the public sector through technology uh, and has worked uh, extensively within government as well. Uh, Matt Warman is uh, the uh, Member of Parliament for Boston and Skegness. Uh, he was until uh, recently a Minister at uh, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and uh, Sport, has also had a long uh, history uh, of expertise on technology and digital policy, both as a journalist and in Parliament. Um, and uh, Rachel Clamp uh, is uh, our uh, 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 friend and colleague at uh, PA Consulting. She's Global Head of uh, Public se Sector Marketing at um, PA and has lots of experience working in the public and private uh, sector, uh, particularly on uh, engineering and defence issues. And we are really pleased uh, that PA Consulting are partnering with us today to uh, help uh, deliver this event. So thank you, PA, and thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, I'll... Uh, uh, I'll open up then and uh, ask uh, Matt first to give us a sort of bit of contextual view. Say if the mics are getting uh, getting dodgy, uh, a bit of uh, sort of contextual thoughts on the uh, opportunities to provide more services through technology. What you've seen over the course of the last uh, eighteen months uh, and um, before that, um, and uh, particularly what's interesting, and I think this might become a theme. It certainly has a lot of events that we've done about join up across government and outside government and how we can just you know, make the most of that. So uh, Matt, kick us off. Lovely. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, it's, as has been said, well done for making it up this early or staying up all night, depending on your point of view. Um, so, so I suppose the two or three things that I would kick off with are that the thing, the thing that strikes me is that government is always lumbered with a challenge that businesses simply do not have, which is that when you turn on the digital service, whatever that digital service might be, you have to keep on the analog service as well. And so uh, it's a bit like saying to Amazon, you have to run Waterstones as well, uh, and, and you have to imagine that you're also going to run a profit. And that, that's an immense challenge, not because you have to run two services in parallel, actually, but more because the people who are designing those two services <coughs> usually simply don't have the bandwidth to do what, what you need them to do. And so where, uh, uh, and, and there, are, there are tons of examples, but where you're trying to use universal credit, for instance, as the most obvious example, you, we would be, uh, it's a sort of fantastic Nirvana dream that you're going to be able to say, this is a entirely digital system, this will just work seamlessly. And, and uh, there is a version of it that does work seamlessly, but the people who need to be able to use it often need assistance, often need to, you often need to acknowledge that they're simply not going to be able to uh, log on in the way that it was designed for. And therefore you end up uh, a running effectively the older analog system or uh, even worse you end up paying someone to assist someone to use the digital version so you end up ramping up the costs at every opportunity and that's a challenge that government faces that I think is not as uh, well understood or as well articulated as perhaps it should be so that that's I suppose the first challenge um, that strikes me um, the second is that more often than not 
I felt like I was being asked to promise things, and this is more of a manifesto observation than it is a, a government observation, where actually government control, government levers, were much, much more limited than the public perceived them to be. So, for instance, if you've applied for a passport online recently, then you'll notice it, it's actually a really good system. Passports, um, tax li um, driving, ta um, driving licenses, tax discs, that sort of stuff. Things where government can simply say, right, this is the system, we're going to do it, it will, it will be as it is, relatively easy, relatively straightforward. If you compare that to the things that we often talk about, and I'm sure Martin will, will, will come on to this, but for instance, we say we'll make it easier to make an appointment at your GP. Now, uh, if we, we can come on to the difficulties of actually accessing GPs, but in terms of the system that you use to make that booking, government doesn't have very much control over this is the system we want GPs to use because they're individual businesses. And yet we talk about it as though the government runs the health service and the health secretary pulls a lever and this is just what happens. And so I think what we're going to find increasingly is that the talk of digitising government will run up against the fact that government doesn't run anywhere near as much as we think it does. Um, and so our ability to say this is what will happen will expose those somewhat fractured relationships between government and the private sector, between uh, government and, and devolution, between government uh, and charities very often, where simply the opportunity to say this is how it will work is really limited. And that, that to me feels like quite a fundamental democratic deficit, is you've got, you've got a government that makes claims, makes, uh, makes policy statements, makes uh, promises in manifestos, where it simply does not have the authority to make those changes. And we don't, we've not, prior to the broader digitization agenda, really run up against that, because Joe Public was not able to say, I know what good looks like because it's over here, and compare it to what they personally had available to them. So I think there are going to be some quite fundamental who runs what uh, questions around some of this stuff. And I think what that will lead to is a call for greater centralization that will get really quite crunchy quite soon. Um, and to continue with the GP example, if, if government were to say, well, that is the booking system that you use for every single appointment, and that doesn't mandate what the availability of those appointments is, but this is simply the, uh, the, the way that you access that service, that is a fundamental shift in the relationship between government and GPs. You will, and you can replicate that across a whole host of areas. So I think what we're going to see over the next few years is a real push in this direction because people will say, we've all seen what happened during the pandemic. We've all seen that even granny, when she has to, can do that online shopping that for years we've been told that she would never actually do, while simultaneously really struggling with the fact that uh, that, uh, that the government's authority, the government's opportunity to make those changes is much more constrained than the public <laughs> think it might be and much more constrained than government claims it is when political parties go in to fight elections. So uh, on that, uh, I've, I've su I think I've successfully identified some, uh, some, some problems and very few solutions, uh, and I will leave it to my fellow panel members to do the solution. I'll come back to you, Matt. Oh, um, <laughs> bother. And... Um, uh, uh, and, and uh, a sort of um, eloquent uh, exposition of the limits of the uh, state, <laughs> and the uh, limits of government, which is a, a, a really uh, useful reminder in this context. Uh, thank you. So, um, Simon, so p picking up particularly on what Matt was saying there about democratic deficit, um, some of the uh, mismatch between public expectations and uh, uh, what uh, government can actually uh, do. Um, what do you think about your your, your uh, organisation is called Public? What do you think about how to bring the public along uh, on, on on the use of uh, tech and services? It's a great question, and having been trained as a civil servant, I'm actually going to answer a slightly different question before I come to your question, um, <laughs> which is, I think, <laughs> which is to take a step back to understand the people who are designing the services. So if you're bringing, you know, if you need to bring the public with you, you need to bring public services with you. You need to make sure that the people who are designing and procuring the public services understand what technology can do for them. And currently, there's quite a big um, deficit in digital literacy within government, unless you work in DDAP or in GDS. There's 
I think it's really important, first of all, to answer that question by thinking about how we can bring officials along. Um, digital literacy needs to be inbuilt into government because if you're truly to make a change to public services, I think it's really important to understand what technology can do. So, for example, you know, we've just set up something called the Public School of Technology, which is a different way for public officials to learn about technology. It's about embedding people in a startup culture. It's about understanding all of the different solutions that are available to them. So, you know, watch the space, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then in terms of citizens, to answer your question slightly more directly, uh, I think there's been quite a big expectation set over the pandemic about what digital services can mm. do for citizens. Um, you, know, you look at NHSX, for example, if there's a, there's a theme appearing here, um, you know, they had their plan that was for, you know, three to five years, which they delivered in three to five months because they had to. And now they're in a situation where, you know, they're trying to work out what they do next because it's no longer about putting GP appointments online. It's about actually how can you more fundamentally transform the service. But I completely agree with what Matt was saying about the difference between the public and the private sector. Whereas the private sector, you know, there's that expectation and it just happens. The public sector needs to do quite a bit more <laughs> to catch themselves up and also to bring citizens with them. Um, if you think about the successes within the pandemic, sorry, they weren't always from the big providers. They didn't always come from the incumbents. You know, you look at the um, the national booking service for the COVID vaccine. It's these kind of smart, small, cross-functional, agile teams. And yes, it didn't start very well, but the one thing that they did really, really well was because they had to go so quickly, they embedded citizens and users into their design process. And so at every stage, they were working with the people who will be using the service. So they were bringing the citizens along with them from the start of their design process. And yes, it wasn't perfect at the start, but it's doing pretty well now. Mm. Um, and that is just an example of how, actually, if you, work, if you understand technology and if you understand the impact that technology can have and you work with the end users who have the expectations who are going to be using the service and you constantly iterate throughout you know, the design and the creation, it, it works. Um, I think there's, I would say this, but there's something about a productive urgency that comes with a startup culture. You have to get things right, or you have to try things new. You have to kind of try and grow and make things better. Um, and I think there's a lot that bigger companies and the government can learn from that kind of startup mindset to try and bring those citizens along and build better public services. Thanks, Emma. So as, as well as the sort of startup mindset, in, in a sense you're saying you, uh, <laughs> that uh, it's not bringing the public along isn't about some sort of you know campaign, it's about building in the needs exactly. of exactly. users and the public in the first place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming at some point later on I'll get to bang on about procurement and you know, ensuring that I'll you write that down. <laughs> um, thank you, Summer. And uh, Martin, uh, again, sort of continuing the, the, the theme, but I mean your expertise is on Health has sort of come up a few times already, and we all saw the you know, GPs face-to-face -face appointments headlines, which has caused uh, much uh, uh, awareness and gnashing of teeth amongst um, my GP friends, anyway. Um, uh, but uh, that, that sort of uh, a trade-off there about sort of increasing efficiency without damaging quality, building in uh, mm -hmm. uh, users. How, how, how does that look to you from the um, uh, healthcare? Yeah. So, th so thanks, Alex, and, and morning, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd like to take the conversation. I think from the kind of um, policy sphere into the swampy lowlands of frontline care, what, what, what does technology mean? Um, and, and perhaps use general practice and use of technology to improve clinical care as a, as a case study, if you, if you like. So um, the, the traditional model of general practice was 10 minute face-to-face -face appointments. That wasn't God given, it didn't come down from heaven, it just kind of over decades has evolved as the traditional model and we were very low tech. As a, as, a, as a specialty, indeed, I think that's probably the case across most um, uh, clinical and, and medical specialties I in particular. Um, so um, we're now in a very different place, um, undoubtedly catalyzed by, by COVID. There were some great examples of use of technology, but very isolated and very patchy. Now, as a consequence of, of the pandemic, we see much greater use of technology, probably in four areas as far as general practice is concerned. So the first one is triage. So uh, it was very clear from the very beginning that we couldn't have lots of people walking into our buildings, uh, having undifferentiated, unplanned appointments because of the risk of, 
uh, transmitting infections, so triage systems were introduced in order to essentially be able to support patients into the best part of the system and only into face-to-face -face appointments as they were required. So triage, triage is one area. Um, the second area is consulting itself, which, as you say, has been the really hot area um, for the last um, several months. Um, interesting, I mean, 85% of consultations in general practice were conducted face-to-face -face before the pandemic. At the height of the first wave of the pandemic, that was down to 10%. Now it's back to about uh, 60%. So we've seen a, a real shift, um, a significant shift. That 60% is something which is causing a lot of um, uh, public and, and political angst. Um, I think unnecessarily. I think in a year's time we'll, uh, we'll look back on, on where we are. We'll say 80% of consultations face-to-face -face before the pandemic. We learned a lot about what we can do digitally. Now it's 60% and that feels about right. And I think the Daily Mail will apologise. No, I, maybe, I don't, don't maybe, maybe I don't think. No, maybe I, maybe I don't think that. But I, but I think there's there's a, there's a there's an evolution that, that, that we've seen. So I think uh, face to face consultations is is something that we're going to continue using, and, and is a is a good thing for some people. You know, I work in a uh, in a inner city area in East London, um, socioeconomically deprived but very tech enabled, and I'm now starting to see particularly young men, a group that very rarely came to their GP, now seeking help. So we've opened up access for a new group. It's the same for people who are housebound. It's the same for people who have child caring or, or older people caring responsibilities. It's the same for people that can't leave work. So, so there's something about the use of technology which is going to be with us and we're going to continue using it. Um, the third area is around referrals. So again, the traditional model was we would, when we need help, send a uh, patient, uh, send a referral to a hospital ser services and a consultant would see the patient at some stage or other face-to-face um, -face in an outpatient department and then send a referral back. Now increasingly we're having three-way digital um, um, outpatient consultations. So the patient, the GP and the consultant together, learning together, working together, really exciting. And then the fourth and final area in which we're using technology is uh, around uh, digital monitoring. And again, it's exciting. During the pandemic, we were using it in particular to monitor people who were vulnerable, at risk, weren't sure that we knew that with COVID they could go off very rapidly. So we were monitoring their oxygen sats, monitoring their blood pressure, their pulse rates. We knew when people were going off and when they needed to be referred. So that was really good. But increasingly, we're using it for the monitoring of long-term conditions as well. There's nothing stopping people taking their own blood pressure now and just informing us. They don't need to come and see us anymore to have their blood pressure done every six months if they're hypertensive or whatever. So, and the same for diabetes, the same for, for thyroid conditions, a whole range of conditions that we can monitor remotely. So um, technology is with us. It's, uh, it's exciting. The biggest challenge for general practice is the lack of investment in technology. And um, I think as it has been described, the kind of diversity of, of providers, which isn't a bad thing in itself, but it, it just means at the moment we, we don't really have um, agreed standards for the use of technology, and that would be very helpful for us. And it's really interesting. Thanks, uh, uh, Martin. And, um, uh, look, I suppose it's a bit different across your four different areas, but uh, have you seen a, a different adoption of technology, different use of technology across different parts of the country? Is there kind of geographical aspects that you've touched on East London being different? Uh, yes, yes, with, with, without doubt. And that, and that is about um, the degree of comfort with, with the use of technology, I think. So in, in my practice, for the reasons I've described, we've got a young population and a mm. tech-enabled population. I suspect the proportion of remote consultations will be a lot higher than in a part of the country where they've possibly got an older, more stable uh, population with more conditions uh, and really need face-to-face -face consultations. And I don't want to stereotype because we know that uh, older people use technology perfectly well, but, but overall probably less likely to use technology, at least for now, and a higher level of support required for to help them to use technology until, until they get used to it. Great. Thanks, um, Martin. We'll come back to some of those themes uh, as, as well. Uh, Rachel, to finish off our first sort of tour around, um, uh, we'll broaden it out a little bit. Um, uh, what's your take on the uh, the general role of the private sector in working with uh, government uh, uh, transplant services? There's sort of different elements of that crossing the, the institution so far. So um, what's, what's your take there? Yes, so um, Declaration, I have spent much of my career championing closer collaboration and highlighting the benefits of the private sector working with the public sector. So let's make that quite clear. That's where I come from. Um, but one of the things, uh, listening to everybody speaking, I became very aware that during that period, one of the things we heard a lot was about the private sector, digital, it's all about mm. technology, we need to go this way. And then we heard a lot from the public sector. But talking about 
the end of the day with the patient as a goal, that's fine. However, a lot of the people that engage with our services actually don't want that. It's the people that aren't engaging that want that hands on education for when they have to. And so you had that, that um, the future is, techni- uh, is digital and technological, or technical, but there's a really need to be an audience with us. Then the pandemic hit and changed a lot of that. And to the point of Granny now doing her shopping online, good. I'm glad she could get an appointment uh, delivery because <laughs> that's who should have been getting deliveries, which is great. Um, but I think uh, with part of that as well, and to, to Simon's point about the um, the, deli- the actual specification of what's needed and that understanding what that end problem is, and I think that's where the private sector can help. There's three th- things that, that came to mind. First of all, speed of technology, as it just, just highlighted as well, it means it's phenomenal pace. So I think what we then need to, to do is the unrealistic is that we need to expect government and all those departments and all those areas we've been talking about in a fragmented way to be able to be right at the forefront, which actually now is where the public want them to be because we've demonstrated over the last two years that's what can happen. But if you start to then think about, well, actually, get to the nuts and bolts of working with the private sector when it comes to transforming services, we have to write a brief. We have to write the spec to get the ITT out, to get the contract. And actually, then you start to think about what actually is the outcome that's needed and what are the measures of, of success. So it goes straight, it moves away from just saying, we need an online booking system for GPs, and it starts to look at the, the nuts and bolts of it. So you've got better specification, therefore probably better outcome. Then you've got the, the, the blended teams, bringing in uh, diverse teams of experts, and you can then upskill one another in different ways through osmosis, and I think that works right from the top. I've heard lots of talk over the last couple of days around uh, improving leadership skills and, and how that can uh, bring in sort of more skills across when you can't necessarily enter at top level, and you can increasingly at civil service. How can you learn from your external peers? And then also, the final point, it instills a culture of collaboration with shared goals, shared mm-hmm. achievements, and shared purposes. If you look at the um, particular example, that one of, one of the, the successes, which we were involved with, big companies were involved with in the pandemic, Ventilator Challenge, PA Consulting was uh, right at the heart of all that. It was a shared purpose, shared goal, shared achievement, brought together all those organisations, and it was a phenomenal achievement. Great brief was written, so we knew what was needed from the outcome. We were able to measure the success and blended to teams learn a lot from one another. Public se- private sector, if nothing else, just helping the way you think about how you approach a project. Yeah. I'm enjoying the, uh, the startup uh, <laughs> big consultancy dynamic here. We can uh, we'll keep, keep moving. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. Really, really, uh, really interesting. Uh, Matt, I, I mean, you touched on this, and I, I, I mentioned it as well. Uh, but the as the as the only one of us who has to face the general electorate, <laughs> um, what what do you think uh, tech is doing to to that sort of relationship between the citizen and the state? Is it just a is it just another sort of ordinary evolution in how uh, government works, or is it doing something more kind of profound and deeper to our relationship with government and our interactions with government? What do you think? Um, I think yes and no is is the short answer. I, I think people are so if this were a constituency event, um, then it certainly wouldn't be at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but <laughs> if, 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 this were, if this were a constituency <laughs> event, um, then uh, people, th- then th- the first topic of conversation would be, and in the sort of half a dozen I've done since we're able to do these things, it would be, why can't I get an appointment at my, at my GP? They are only doing things through the internet. And isn't that awful? And, and it's not true. And uh, I'm married to a GP, so I've definitely been told it's not true a lot. Um, but uh, it, it, all, all of that stuff is not true. But those people making those points are talking about the digitization of public services, among other things. So, it, and obviously, they don't realize it, and they don't necessarily need to realize it. But it does change the dynamic because all of a sudden you're talking about a whole host of things that simply were not an issue pre pandemic. So, I, I think there is a bit of uh, a Th- 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 there is there is a bit of a sense that we have to have conversations that involve a completely different skill set to the one that we uh, were not that long ago. But uh, on the uh, to, to answer your sort of main question, does it change anything fundamentally? I th- I don't think it does, but it does as, as you said a minute ago. It does raise people's expectations massively mm. because the idea that I can book a one hour delivery <laughs> slot and I get a text message saying it will ar- whatever you've ordered will arrive between 12.33 and 1.33 the difference between mm. that and public services mm. is so vast and people simply can't comprehend that government with all of its money 
and you're now taking even more of the more of our t- more of our money in taxes, and yet I get a better service from Hermes than I do from you, and and that's that disconnect is something that politicians are going to be wrestling with for a long long time. Mm, it's really interesting. And Tom, what do you think? I just I'm actually going to answer the question this time, um, <laughs> and I'd actually be interested in your view on this. I think that <laughs> that we've been we've spent the last several months working on a report on digital services and government and the breadth of what the public service has to provide Mm. is massive but also the difference in the level of provision so you can go on the dvla website and you can renew your driving license in about three clicks which i've done recently i've also recently tried to shut down a childcare account which i still haven't managed to do because of it being a digital service that requires a letter being sent to you in the post that requires a text to get the passcode for this but that's really common, right? Mm. So I've got a couple of things here which I'd also be interested to get your view on. For me, that speaks to a lack of centralization of digital services and government. And it was a point you made right at the beginning about the disparity across Whitehall and the lack of connection across Whitehall and whether it's DDAT or GDS or whoever, not having necessarily the power to take that cross functional view, you know, the way that NHSX and NHS Digital are supposed to do in the health service, it doesn't exist in the same way necessarily in public services. There's also, agree with Matt, what he was saying about the citizen needs, citizen expectation, you know, you don't need to go through that again, but th- it's it's completely different now. It's ready for more faster, more personalised services. And there is also a massive part of the population who's never going to want that, who is always going to want to see their GP face to face. And there are things in the social care sector that the digital revolution is never going to be able to replace. I don't want a robot caring for my gran. I want a carer caring for my gran. I want it to be augmented by wearable technology, but that's not going to be replaced. So the scale of the problem that Whitehall has to fix in a very different world in terms of citizen expectation is quite astronomical. And I think that there is something that government needs to do in terms of creating an infrastructure and an inbuilt digital literacy within government mm. to try and fix that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I can, I can waffle on about uh, digital in Whitehall and join mm-hmm. our government at some point, which I will mm-hmm. do, but Martin, you wanted to come in. Yeah, sorry, I agree entirely with Sam. I think one of the challenges here is we're not taking the public uh, with us. And mm. um, A.A. Gill, the, the journalist and, and social commentator, once described civilization as a continuous process of anger and then acceptance and then admiration which I think is, is quite a nice kind of description, and, and, and we're possibly in the anger, not quite in the acceptance uh, phase of what we're doing what we're doing now. So, uh, so I think um, if you look at progressive practices who years ago, pre-pandemic, started using digital services more, they will all, almost all say that it took them at least two years, even though they, it, was, it was at peacetime, they were planful about it, they tried to do their best, tried to train their staff, they tried to take their presence with them. It still took a couple of years before they got to a stage where it was routinely accepted. And we have to remember that, uh, particularly in general practice, we introduced digital technologies in two to three weeks, not two to three years. So it's not surprising that we haven't got it right. Mm. Now's the time to step back and get it right, support clinicians to do it well, but most importantly, support patients to use the service um, uh, helpfully to, to meet their needs. Thanks, Martin. And I will um, I will take the opportunity, Tom and Gabby, to talk a bit about AGDS and see how Rachel's reactions to it um, uh, and what it's like from the outside working with uh, uh, the government, how it, how it feels would be really interesting. I mean, on, on, on the government digital service, I certainly think from 2010 to 2015, there was a sort of startup mm. phase, um, uh, a powerful, sort of charismatic and civil service terms uh, leader in Mike uh, Bracken, a ministerial champion in Francis Maud. Um, government uh, digital was really you know, quite profoundly changed in that period and, and, and built up. I have to say it was a nightmare as a civil servant as I was when you were on the receiving end of it because you'd be trying to do something related to a digital service and you'd talk to the government digital service and they'd say, no, we can't do that, it doesn't meet our standards. And yeah. and, you know, it was a complete, a complete pain, but it was the right thing to do. Exactly, because it, it was trying to approve something. Yeah, because it set a common standard exactly. and, it, and, and there was energy and, uh, and, and both ministerial and a bureaucratic drive yeah. behind it. And so I'm with Rachel. The previous CDL, Michael Gove, was a good ally for reform in that area, and I'm watching this space to see what Steve Barclay does. Yeah, I'm optimistic about Steve Barclay because I think his uh, his CV in terms yeah, of I think being chief right. secretary and uh, some of his focus on data and digital mm. in the past means that he's he's if he, if he wants to be, he's, he's potentially quite well um, uh, qualified to, to make some progress. <laughs> but I, I said I was going to come to Rachel. So Ra- Rachel, what's what's it like from uh, working with government from uh, the old commissioner? 
Oh, that's a good question. One you answer very clear. No, it's <laughs> it's one Great. of the things. I think going back to, to your comments about GDS, I think one of the things that is sort of always uh, nice is when things make uh, make people uncomfortable, that generally means you're making a change that's good. And I think that's and that's one of the things that GDS definitely did. There was a lot of reaction in there, and, and it's a shame that some of the, the, the amazing benefits that were um, championed in that area don't aren't, aren't still happening. Uh, because I think we, do have, we have lost a lot of that, and, and we do see some of the uh, things that are coming out saying, okay, over here we want one of these, over there we wanted one of these, but with a little extra little gold button on it, and it's you can start to see that there's the opportunity to come together. And I think one of the things that we would have liked to see is cross gov better cross government working and better working with of course working with the private sector but starting to bring that uh, that in and um, instilling those behaviors and driving that forwards and also um, some of the, the teams you get to work it's not necessarily um, it's not working with somebody so they don't give you I want an X mm. it's mm. we need to achieve Y and I think that's that's the big thing and the better the, the not just for the better clients the more interesting projects you get and where you have a greater impact get better value for the public purse as well, better uh, uh, satisfaction and just general happiness for employees is when they're working on a project where they can prove that. Mm. But unfortunately, that's going to create a bit of um, uh, tension, a bit un uh, uncomfortable, but that's not the way things were always done. So um, I think, yeah. yeah. Which leads you back around to the point, Sonny, you're making about building and using these and, and not saying yes. we've, we've got this, this box that we need, yeah. but we kind of tackling the problem in a different way. Um, Matt, you, you've been in the centre of some of the government uh, discussions around uh, digital, uh, wh what do you think, there's, there's this sort of, um, uh, it's almost hardened into a kind of truism about uh, government digital service uh, uh, going through this sort of growth phase and then kind of retrenching back a little bit, do you think that's fair or do you think, you know? Y yeah, yeah I, th I, th I, think, I think that's definitely fair and I think the, the idea that GDS was initially the sort of crack squad that will come in and, and break stuff and upset you, as, as you say, but it will produce something better at the end, m became this idea, well, if we could just embed that kind of culture across everything, mm. then it would just be, it, that, that's what everyone wants to see. And actually, you can't do that. You, you, you do, you, I think you're, you do need <laughs> that outside perspective to, to bring in that expertise. And I think in some ways, what GDS embodied um, is that idea that if you if you just get on with doing something that is really impressive, the public will accept it mm. because they'll see that it's good. Which is a very private sector sort of. People didn't know they needed Facebook till they saw Facebook kind of thing, and then it's it turns ex exactly, <laughs> and, 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 and and then it turns out that they will give away all their data yeah. because mm. they just they they, they, they they perceive the value, or they don't perceive that they're giving away their data, or whichever way around mm. it is, it's apparently fine. When you then try and do that with patient data. People get terribly fret for for some reasons that I think are good, some reasons that I think are overblown. In practice, it puts the brakes on the whole thing. If you were just Facebook, you'd build it and say, "Well, look, if you d if you don't like it, don't use it." Kind of thing. So government doesn't have those opportunities, and it doesn't really have a way of forcing it through because it's not democratic. You know, like you you do have to do these things with a degree of consent, but at the same time, I <coughs> do think there is greater room for people just get on with it and demonstrate what's what's going on. And, and, the, and the, the case study for this will be digital identity, yeah. where yeah. There, there is a real opportunity to say what you want is personalized government services, what you want is something where it logs on and it knows that you, 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 I don't know, you're, you're doing three apparently unconnected things, but the government has uh, the oversight of, of, the, of that. And there'll be huge I mean, there's already huge angst right at the extreme sort of COVID skeptic end of the spectrum about this is apparently the, the government turning into the Chinese state, which it isn't. Um, but the only way we will make the case for that stuff is to do it and demonstrate that it, that it, re that it really exists. Um, that's going to be challenging. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Matt. Rachel, I mean, um, one of the things, the only is in private sector, you want someone to do something, you demonstrate the benefits. And I think that starts to become a real big challenge as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, Maybe there needs to be that little bit more of a what's the citizen benefit of doing this? I, I also find it absolutely astonishing the fact that somebody will go onto a website, put all their details into it, uh, but actually won't necessarily then sign up to the new NHS app that has all their details on it because, oh my goodness, they've got everything on their phone. Have you looked at your Facebook profile? Seriously. Um, personal opinion. Um, <laughs> so, but as, and I think that there was that whole public perception 
and I think that the, the COVID did a lot to see the reaction and um, the McDermott platform is a super public sector stood up and kept everything moving as much as they could which was fantastic but I think there's that but also to your, to your point, uh, previous earlier point that's raised our expectation and that's now really difficult um, to, to continue going with that but if we need to continue to demonstrate some of those benefits and that's when you start to get that more buy-in from the public Thanks Rachel I'm going to um, ask Martin about sort of some of the sort of parallels or not with healthcare system and NHS mm. uh, X and then uh, Saima uh, procurement uh, you can have a quick word about uh, ab about that because I'm interested in your take on it and then I'll come to uh, the audience for any um, uh, questions that you've got in the last uh, sort of uh, 15, 20 minutes or so um, mm. but but Martin you talked about government digital service there is this thing called NHS X uh, NHS uh, digital it's um, been through its fair share of trials and tribulations in the last uh, 18 months as you mm. uh, hinted at does it is it, is, is it working? Has that got purchase on the system? Uh, or are there more reforms that the NHS needs to make to, um, uh, to sort of organise its governance around digital learning? Yeah, I think, I think it's... Um, well, I mean, of course, they're two different organisations, NHS X and NHS Digital, yes. and, and I, I don't think anyone's entirely clear what the future of NHS X is, given that it was kind of Matt Hancock's baby. It was, it was I think, a, a reasonable attempt to bring together a range of digital activities across government. Uh, whether it's working, I'm not sure. NHS Digital, um, I think, is full of a, a group of uh, very bright, very committed people, um, uh, mostly dragged down into, dragged down, is that the right word? Into the kind of data security issues, the confidentiality issues, find it very difficult to lift their head to the horizon and look at some of the kind of big, bigger issues. Maybe that's the nature of a body that um, you know, it's, it's has to be so close to government. Um, is it having an impact on what we do on the in the service? Yes, it is. Um, uh, I think it, it, one of the biggest challenges for us in the service remains a lack of a clear strategic direction which people stick to. So, you know, speak to my colleagues uh, right now and they'll say, so um, does government want us to do digital consultation or not? Mm. Because um, it wasn't very long ago that the answer was definitely yes, you've got to do it, this is the future. And now we're saying, actually, no, um, you know, all, everything has to be face-to-face, -face, or most things have to be face-to-face. -face. So some consistency of messaging for the centre would be, uh, would be extremely helpful. And, um, and dare I say, investment <laughs> would be very helpful uh, as well. So we talk about the exciting, shiny end of, of technology uh, in general practice. Most GPs have still got very uh, little broadband width, uh, very <coughs> poor technology, um, uh, both hardware and software that they're using. Um, and so a simple thing like um, being able to um, take your computer home and use it for remote consultations at different times of the day or night, which might be very helpful for a lot of particularly younger GPs with families, is just really technically difficult. So, so if you want to get this right, more investment is what we need. And um, you teed up the, uh, my last question to Simon. With, with, uh, if you're going to have more investment, um, public services need to procure it well, need to get value for money. Uh, what's, what's your advice to go if, if um, uh, government came to you and said, uh, as you know, they, they, they do sometimes, they do, how do we, we, have uh, told them. How do we, how do we uh, um, get best value for money in all, all this investment that we're putting into um, public services? Thank you for what letting me saying. get on my soapbox about <laughs> this. Um, I think there's something that you were saying about tenders versus outcomes, right? You need to build in the citizen need from the start. Um, and rather than saying, we want this solution, sometimes say, we have this problem. Government has done that really well, for example, with something like the Shared Outcomes Fund projects, where it's actually, you know, how can technology support all of these different areas, whether it's on prison leavers or, you know, there's loads of examples and I can't remember any of them, apart from prison leavers. Um, and, you know, that is an example of where government are actually spending the time thinking about how technology can positively impact public services. And that's both in terms of value for money, but also in terms of better public services. But there are also fundamental issues with some of the government procurement services um, where some of the rules automatically exclude companies like ours who are at the forefront of actually understanding what new technological services can look like for government and for the citizens. So there's a couple of things there about how government can um, work more closely to make sure citizen needs and better outcomes are inbuilt to procurement in the first place, but also that they don't continue to create a situation where the people who keep winning contracts are the people who have delivered it for however many years. Because if you come back to what I was saying right at the beginning about the startup mentality, 
if you want to make things better and if you want to improve public services and if you want to have better value for money for the taxpayer, you've got to make sure that you're constantly trying to find the best solution. Mm. And the current rules for procurement don't necessarily allow for that. Thank you. Um, questions from you now. Uh, we've got the road the microphone there. Let's uh, probably few enough we can take them um, one at a time. So we'll I was just going to uh, quickly ask, um, do you think the new procurement rules coming through the Health and Social Care Bill will do that? Just to um, What I should have done is read the new procurement rules for the Health and Social Care Bill <laughs> before I came. Extremely honest. I yeah, commend it. I know. Thanks. Sorry. I should have been like, well, you know, there's some good points and some bad points. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I didn't read them specifically. Do you have any views on that? <laughs> I have no, views on, the the no views on the detail of it, Sarah. Thank you for that, for that, <laughs> <laughs> that hand-off. Um, I, I do believe that um, uh, when the health and care bill is, is implemented in practice, it could have a significant impact on integration across the health service, a service that feels very fragmented to uh, patients, but that will only happen if there's sufficient investment in technology across the system. And at the moment, um, probably general practice is, is in the lead in terms of its embracement of technology, but our ability to communicate with hospital colleagues, mm. with people working in social care is really very poor at the moment. So um, we're not going. The health and care bill isn't going to realise its potential if we don't invest in technology to allow it to do so. Just to add to that, thank you for giving me some time. To <laughs> <laughs> to pleasure. Um, is one of the things is it, I'm encouraged by the fact that the conversation is actually happening um, because it kind of it shows a willingness to listen and learn. And I can't tell you what the answer is going to be because there's lots of other factors at play here. But the fact that the conversation is happening is encouraging, and I agree with what you're saying about actually if it can be used as a way to centralise standards, to um, encourage people to start having more of a conversation, that's going to be a good thing. I feel like I, could, I should ask you what you think, but you don't have to... Uh, <laughs> have, you have you read, read all of it? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I wouldn't want to sort of in, uh, go into a field like that. I mean, I think that uh, what they're driving is the concerns that I was seeing just a moment. From my understanding, all contract service gets a level master of that by September of the year. ITFC to just continue on to discuss the concept of a fixed standard. I mean, that went on to a point about making sure that every client contract mm. gets a renewal to best serve the trade in the future. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Mm. We're nodding sagely. Um, <laughs> thank you. There's a question at the, uh, at the back there, I think. Yeah. Sorry. If I can be very cheeky and fit in a comment and a question. One comment. I think neither public sector nor private sector are particularly good at designing third for a third party to operate on a user's behalf. Try using a digital power of attorney on any digital system anywhere. Mm. It just comes to the political fore in the private public sector much more so. Um, what I was going to actually ask is we've focused quite rightly on the interface between the citizen and government but those systems themselves depend on the underlying systems, uh, systems of record. Uh, you mentioned DNHS Digital and what they're doing, obviously, on that area. You've got DWC, HMRC, the, the list goes on. Some of these systems are bang up to date. Some of these systems were bang up to date when they were put in in the 70s. But how do you actually get the public to understand the need to tackle that kind of legacy? Mm. Because in many areas, we're seeing the government to citizen interface hitting the limits of what's possible because of these underlying systems of record. That's a really uh, good point. Thank you. And I uh, absolutely recognise the sort of the uh, long-term underinvestment in, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the boring stuff, if I can put it uh, that way, whether that's, whether that's digital or, you know, government buildings or uh, anything else. It's certainly, uh, certainly a big thing. I, I, I sense there is a more of a recognition of that now than there has been perhaps in the past, but... Yeah, no, I, th I think there definitely is more of a recognition of it. I think all of it, though, comes back to a version of a comms kind of challenge. You need, you need a narrative coming from government that convinces whatever sector it might be and the public that this hard thing, whatever that hard thing might be, uh, is, is worthwhile. And it, I think it applies particularly to digital in, in ways that we haven't really thought about for, for a while. And, and I think there is sometimes the... 
uh, I, I suppose to use the, G, the G, GP example, the, the sort of the frustration from the public is I can't get an appointment at my GP. Fundamentally, that's nothing to do with technology. It's about not having enough GPs. That uh, that was one of the central planks on which the government fought the election was training more GPs. So there is a sort of there is an acknowledgement directly from government that we don't have enough GPs. We should be training more. We are training more. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and part of it is driven by increasing efficiency through technology, part of it is driven by having more people. But that narrative doesn't come through to, to, to the public. And I think a lot of that therefore ends up with people being really profoundly disillusioned in, uh, and, and, and that applies to the profession, whatever the profession might be, as much as it applies to the public. And I think, uh, Lo and behold, government needs to be better at communication. is is not a revelation, uh, but but I think it is a particularly acute problem at the moment. Could it, Alec, sorry, Alex, can I just come in on, on yeah. Matt's comment because I think yeah. Matt's absolutely right that um, better use of technology should improve efficiency, should improve uh, productivity. But if I could just again coming back to the swampy land has described described two ways in which it, it, it doesn't happen, w what we expect wouldn't happen. So the fir the first one is. Um, uh, remote consultations using either video or telephone are no quicker than face-to-face -face consultations. In fact, in many ways, they're often slower because you have to spend more time collecting data that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, visually. So, uh, so there isn't an improvement in productivity using technology over face-to-face. -face. Uh, the other um, significant area is around uh, triage. Um, you would have thought that um, uh, providing uh, uh, electronic access uh, to patients to get a rapid conversation with a clinician is a good thing, and it is, uh, by and large. Uh, what we're seeing, though, is a growth in demand as a consequence of that. So this is a simple supply-demand uh, issue, and, and a lot of that demand um, uh, isn't necessary demand. So the number of consultations I have, maybe 24 hours after someone's booked an appointment, with a young, fit person who had a sore throat, and I'll give them a call uh, back, and they'll say, oh, well, thanks very much for the call, but actually my sore throat's better now. I don't really need it. So, so there's definitely a supply-demand issue here. So I think we're a long way away from uh, certainly technology in my sector improving productivity. But I, I think there's also a that that is still a communications challenge in the sense that yeah. actually it's not okay for that young fit person to phone you up about their sore throat feeling when they've only had it for 16 mm. hours. Kind of thing. Mm. And, and and I think it's very particularly around the health service, but around almost everything, it's very hard for government to say actually th this thing is your problem not our problem uh, and 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 for uh, and, and obviously it's it's all relatively easy for a small state tory to be to be sort of sitting again well you cope um it, it actually what we've seen during the course of the pandemic is that the government's role has expanded all into almost everything and that's winding that back if, if there is a, a political will to wind that back is going to be immensely difficult Profound question for our time. So, Ra Rachel. Sorry, but there's a, that public perception element again. I don't think a lot of the public necessarily would have appreciated that that was a step up. That's just what people expected and thought government were there for them to do. Um, yeah, it, well, I mean, it is what government's there for them to, to do during a pandemic, right? Yes. It, it, it's, it's just what happens le early on. And, and, and I think, for instance, there are things where you, we, we, we will continue quite rightly to say you will get a standard from. Amazon that mm -hmm. you will not get from the state, and if you want that standard from the state, then there are a whole reason, a whole host of reasons why it, why it ain't going to happen. But that conversation remains immensely difficult, and there isn't really a mechanism for the public to talk to the population in a way that is sort of trusted, authoritative, blah 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 blah, um, because everything is is seen through the lens of a. Uh, media that quite rightly expresses a whole host of different views itself. Can I just add an example to that though? Because we Welcome. did a project recently with a government department on how when you're consulting, how can you use digital platforms to access experts and service users? Because having done government consultations a number of times myself, as I'm sure you have on the other side, it is quite painful to be going through an Excel spreadsheet of you know a 38 degrees position against nuclear thousands of them. It's not necessarily the best way to engage with citizens, but, but the solutions exist to do it better. So how can you get government to use them more? Yes. Al although Obviously that's not for everybody, not everybody is going to be able to access that kind of thing, but where they can. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there, there is obviously an opportunity to do more with what is out there. There is, however, a slightly different question about it remains the case that the vast majority of people 
getting in touch with their MD, engaging with a consultation, whatever, are not actually representative mm. of, of, of what is out there. And listening to my post bag is a really bad way of trying mm. to decide what the right It's self selecting, isn't it? It's yeah. the people who have yeah, come well, up, I mean, yeah. We could and probably should at some point do a whole hour on government consultations because <laughs> I can certainly <laughs> talk for at least 25 <laughs> minutes on Which is your favourite uh, one? On how, how appalling <laughs> they are and how they uh, serve no practical purpose apart from avoiding judicial review. <laughs> Uh, Rachel, did you want to come back? I, I was going to add, 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 add this. I actually think there are, we compare it to Amazon a lot, but just because it's the biggest one, we all remember it and, and think of it. But there have been some really good examples in the public sector over the last six months of how they've excelled and it stayed there compared to where the private sector have actually had, still haven't ramped up anything. I can still ring my, uh, maybe uh, energy is the wrong example. I've been trying to ring an insurance company lately. We're, just, you know, we're really busy because of COVID and we haven't. 18 months on, 20 months on, they haven't adapted. Public mm. sector have, and they've responded. I think we have to celebrate some of those amazing achievements and some of those ones that are continuing to, that are still in place because it was an amazing brief and, uh, uh, and what has achieved and we are st well, we're still seeing that and we still need to uh, recognise that benefit in the long term. Mm. Thanks, Rachel. Any final questions? A gentleman there and then a woman there. We'll take both of them together. Thank you. So about two weeks ago, the government published the National AI Strategy, which involved the public sector um, leading the way through procurement and being an exemplar for use of technology, well, AI. To what extent is the use of AI a bit of a pipe dream when it comes to the practicality of delivering public services versus actually driving technological change? And then following up on Matt's point around bringing the public with you, obviously AI is a bit more than an algorithm. But the use of algorithms when it came to children's educational results didn't exactly instill a lot of public confidence mm. in the use of technology. Brilliant, thank you. Sort of the uh, value neutrality of technology or otherwise. We'll, we'll take one other question from the woman here in the back. Hi, um, thank you. Um, that's really, really interesting. Um, my question is on, I guess, following on from Martin's point, which is that not all technology improves productivity in the public services. Um, there are some examples, though, where it clearly could. For example, in, in going back to the case of GP, I suppose e-consultations, um, where say the patient fills out a questionnaire of their symptoms beforehand, that removes time needed to take a history, and uh, and that's also the document goes into the patient's notes, so it's defensible from a medical legal point of view. Um, see, that is an example of something that could save um, could save time and actually increase productivity. And I just wonder. How can we refocus um, technological innovation to those things which do increase productivity, and um, you know we have metrics and measurable results to show that they do? Um, I think that's a big part of it. Thank you. Two great questions there, Martin. Do you want to kick off both on that sort of pro productivity point, and then anything you want to yeah. add on AI and some some of the challenges in the healthcare sector around that? Yeah. So um, so as far as your question is concerned, um, yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting one. I think eConsult, um, it's. The necessity to fill out your information before you see a GP, I think, is fundamentally a good thing. It helps patients to think through what they're looking for when they come to a consultation. I think I think that's good. Uh, the reality in practice is that um, I'll sit down with somebody who's made an e-consult. I'll say, I, I've read your proprietary material. This is how. This is what I think is the problem. Is that correct? The patient will always want to repeat it, more, normally at greater length. So again, this is a kind of this is a this is a, a culture change challenge for all of us to get used to. So I think the potential is great. F in answer to yours, can I just very quickly give a case study because this yeah, is yeah, a yeah, really yeah. interesting one. This is a, a live example of a of a uh, of a AI assisted consultation that I had with a young man who I'd looked after for uh, for quite a few years. I knew that he was an ultra marathon runner, uh, and he developed uh, pain in his lower legs. Um, he went on to a, a, a famous um, AI-driven chatbot um, and entered all his symptoms. Um, he was asked something like, I seem to remember he was asked over 40 questions, and it took him about 25 minutes to complete the uh, questions that he was asked. One of those questions wasn't, uh, have you been for a run recently, in, 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 interestingly. Um, and he was told at the end of that process that he had either a bunion or something called Charcot's joint, which is a joint that's usually related to syphilis. And he wasn't very happy with either of those uh, <laughs> diagnoses. So he then booked in to see me and, um, and told me his story. And I said, what do you think is wrong? And he said, well, I, I think I've got shin splints. And I said, I think you're probably right. It kind of fits with the history. I didn't really have to examine him at all. So I said to him, so, um, so if you know what's wrong with you, um, 
is there something else that's worrying you? And he said, I'm really pleased that you asked me that, uh, Dr. Marshall. Um, I know I'm being completely illogical here, but last year a friend of mine who was also a runner developed pain in his leg, and six months later he was dead from a very rare osteosarcoma, a, a bone tumour. Uh, and he said, I know I'm being completely illogical, but I just, I just want to be reassured that I haven't got bone cancer here. So I examined him, took about 30 seconds, I didn't need to do any investigations, I was able to reassure him and, and put his mind to rest. So there's a kind of example of the, the human relational nature of the practice of medicine. I've got no doubt at all that AI will, will, um, will change, transform the way that we uh, work as clinicians. I think it'll transform the more technical areas like reading myelograms and x-rays a long time before it transforms my work as a GP, but it's going to take a hell of a long time before it transforms my work. Mm. In the meantime, it will duplicate the work. Mm. Really interesting. So and just to add to that, it's a personal anecdote, but I try to avoid uh, every fuss taking my kids to the GP during the pandemic, and I remember taking them having done a phone triage, they were like, we do really need to see you. And my four-year-old was obviously, as they do when you take them anywhere medical, like jumping off the walls, you know, having been lying in the car, now really excited. But it was a really important thing for the GP who said to me, you cannot replace this. You cannot replace face-to-face. There are so, and, and this goes to a point I was making earlier on, there are some things that you can't replace. On paper, she had a chest infection and needed antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, fa- the face-to-face showed that she was well enough not to need that. You can't get that over the phone. You can't get that over video. There are some things that are never going to be replaced by technology, nor should they. And this comes to the point about AI. Where can technology augment services? Where can it, you know, do the some of the administrative tasks around booking or triaging or things like that to direct the human-centered focus exactly where it needs to be directed? Mm-hmm. And that's about how actually in the shorter term, whilst these technologies are developing and being tested, where they can augment services like Dr. Marshall's and make sure that this is, you know, still working. But on your uh, on your other point, an AI, and on your point about the not having the running in there, and your point about the GCSE and A-level results, it's only going to be as good as the people who are programming it. And it's only going to be as good as the people who are helping it learn the questions. It's not iRobot, it's a, you know, it's a program. And it comes back to what I was saying right at the beginning when I didn't answer the question about digital literacy in government. You need to have people who understand the breadth and the scope of how technology can help them, but also working with experts who understand how to use this technology properly so you can make the most of it and not end up in situations like, have I got syphilis, now I've got shin splints, or you know, I didn't get the right A-level results. Mm. So it's, it comes back to making sure that digital literacy is where it needs to be. I think there's also something about the alternative, isn't it? The, the uh, exams uh, algorithm uh, was a um, uh, there was f- there were few good outcomes mm. <laughs> from that, and so there's a risk of undermining people's confidence in some of these things if they're not used really carefully. I'll come to Matt and then Rachel, and then uh, uh, we'll we'll wrap up with him. Yeah. No, I, I mean I'm 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 a little bit sceptical, or maybe more optimistic than, than, than Simon in some ways. Like that, that, that such and such will never be replaced. It's like we would have said that about cash, we would have, uh, which, which will be replaced. We would have said that about mm. a whole host of things. And actually, the people who are sceptical about that are often the people who are on the receiving end of the change. And, and to use the medical example, that, that's, that's actually the profession. It's not, it's not the patient some of the time. So, so when, mm. the, when uh, consultant X says, I will never be replaced, they may not necessarily be wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, 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 do, I do think the way, to, the way to think about AI, and I, I, I was involved in writing the AI strategy, but thanks to the reshuffle, not in launching it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, the way to think of it is, is a bit like cruise control, is that it's something that augments a human, or AI is going to, for a very long time, be something that augments human experience. And it wasn't that long ago that cruise control just told you you're going at 50 miles an hour and it didn't matter if there was a car in front. And now it stops when, you, when the car in front gets closer than you might like. And, and that's going to be the story of AI for a long, long time. And we're going to have, I think, two challenges. The first will be uh, actually getting people to accept that it is genuinely a help. And the second is getting people to st- not say, well, the computer told me to do it, so I, ju- so I just carried on. Because we, we, mm. human beings understand that hitting the car in front is still your problem, um, even if the computer would have let you. Um, wh- but that in public services is going to be very, very difficult. And we did see in, in DfE that, that problem sort of, well, we have designed an algorithm and here are your results. And a little bit of uh, testing what happened when those results were 
trans tra uh, transmitted to an actual human being who wasn't going to university because of what the computer said would have probably meant we wouldn't have ended up in the mess that we're in. Mm. Thanks, Matt. And Rachel, last words. Um, so I, I love working with some of my uh, AI expert colleagues. They are fabulous. And the first thing they say is, please don't buy AI. Don't tell <laughs> me you want AI. What is the, what, is, what problem? What are we trying to address? What's the outcomes? What are the benefits we want to go? And much the same as other technologies, it is not technology or AI for technology or AI's sake. It's to achieve something, it's an enabler. And I think that's one of the things we have to remember with all these different technologies and things that come along. That's just the new thing. AI is going to evolve very, very quickly. It already has done, it's going to continue. So we just need to remember it's there as an enabler, not necessarily, not the answer. Thanks, uh, thank you, Rachel. That's a good point to end on, although I should say I feel I've failed in my duty as a chair because I don't think anyone has said levelling up or build back better. Mm -hmm. Build back uh, digital. Build back digital. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that, uh, at least we've said it now in the, in the uh, Conservative Party uh, fringe event. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to PA uh, uh, for um, partnering with the event. Thank you to um, you for coming uh, along and thank you to a uh, really uh, interesting, thoughtful panel and to all your, all your contributions. So thank you very much. Thanks for having thank us. You. Good day, everyone.